in the earth is a world of life and matter. But man is not a vegetable nor an animal. He is a spiritual and a thinking being who is set here to shape and use the animal mold for higher purposes by higher motives with a more divine instrumentation. Man is a spirit, says Sri Aurobindo, but a spirit that lives as a mental being in physical nature. Sri Aurobindo explains that when we incarnate, we put on a body like we would put on a suit or a robe, an ill-fitting and voluminous robe, he calls it. He also speaks about the physical body as a mold of clay. He says, an immortal spirit in the perishing clay. That's what we are. When we incarnate, it's like our spirit or our psychic being throws itself down into an unconsciousness. Because the physical world even human consciousness, whatever it may be, is very unconscious in comparison with the psychic consciousness. That's what the mother says. So it rushes into an unconsciousness. It is as though it fell on its head that stuns it. Matter reveals itself as the figure and body of spirit. Spirit reveals itself as the soul, the truth, the essence of matter. But we don't put only a physical body on, not only a body of matter. We also put on a vital body, body of life, of energy. It is all our enthusiasms, our passions, our desires, it is our power, our revolves, our impulses, our emotions. And we put on also a mental body. All our thoughts, all our judgments, our prejudices, ethics, ideals, intellectual understanding. These three together, the physical, the vital and the mental, form our surface being. But behind these, is our soul or our true or spiritual being. When we're inside these human bodies, it seems absolutely real. And it is for us at that time. So these knowings were explaining to me that I am a spiritual being, human animal, physical matter. I'm a spiritual being. I'm in, I was inhabiting this human being. Two separate beings two separate personalities, two separate sets of character traits. The person that you think you are is the spiritual being. It's not the human animal. Okay? So when that animal leaves, life stops functioning and dies, you'll still be you because you're the spiritual being inside the human animal. There are, we might say, two beings in us. One on the surface, our ordinary exterior mind, life and body consciousness. Another behind the veil, the inner self, the true self, our soul, our psychic being. Man is a developing spirit trying here to find and fulfill itself in the forms of mind, life, and body. We are not mind or life or body, 
but the informing and sustaining soul, silent, peaceful, eternal, which possesses them. The life, mind and body are instruments of the soul. We can use the image of a computer. The hardware is our physical being. The electric energy that powers the machine is the vital being. And the software, the programs that are installed on the machine is the mental being. But our true self is the user. Each plane of our being, mental, vital, physical, has its own consciousness, separate, though interconnected and interacting. Each has its own distinct nature, its influence, its action on the whole of us. And we can use the image of a horse carriage. The carriage is the physical being, the horse, the vital being, the coachman is the mental being, and the princess seated within is the psychic being, the soul, our true self. There is a stupendous hierarchy of grades of consciousness between darkest matter and most luminous spirit. The carriage is the most unconscious. The horse is a little more conscious. The coachman is even more conscious. In the surface human nature, the proper ruler of the consciousness is the mental being, the coachman. But in most men, the vital, as the desire soul and desire nature, controls the consciousness to a large extent. Because men are governed by desire, which means the horse is leading the show and goes wherever his instinct and animal impulses lead him. But men's highest accomplished range is the life of the reason or ordered and harmonized intelligence, which is or should be the driver of man's chariot. Now mind is all and its uncertain way. Mind is the leader of the body and life. Mind, the thought-driven chariot of the soul, carrying the luminous wanderer in the night to vistas of a far and certain dawn. The psychic, the soul, influences the consciousness from behind. But one has to go out of the ordinary consciousness into the inmost being to find it and make it the ruler of the consciousness as it should be. True harmonization is achieved by finding our real center. The true central being is the soul. But this being stands back and in most nature is only the secret witness. The soul can come forward and control the nature. It is by the coming forward of this true monarch and his taking up of the reins of government that there can take place a real harmonization of our being and our life. This aggregate that we are is, because of its composition, a heterogeneous compound, not a single harmonious and homogeneous whole. This is the reason why there is a constant confusion and even a conflict in our members which our mental reason and will are moved to control and harmonize and have often much difficulty in creating out of their confusion or conflict some kind of order and guidance. Man is not made up of one piece, but of many pieces. And each part of him has a personality of its own. 
the psychologists have begun to glimpse it, but recognize only when there is a marked case of double or multiple personality. But all men are like that, in reality. The aim should be, in yoga, to develop a strong central being and harmonize under it all the rest. A human being, says the mother, a fully developed human individuality is very much like one of those stupendous orchestras which has hundreds and hundreds of players. It is obviously very difficult to control and conduct them, but the result can be marvelous. The conductor of the orchestral movement, says Sri Aurobindo, is the soul coming forward to get its own work done. The center of the human being is the psychic, which is the dwelling place of the immanent divine. Unification means organization and harmonization of all the parts of the being, mental, vital and physical, around this center, so that all the activities of the being may be the correct expression of the will of the Divine Presence. Obey your soul. It alone has the right to govern your life. In most of us, our soul is not the overt guide and master of our thought and acts. But it can become powerful and sovereign armed with an intrinsic spiritual perception of the truth of things and a spontaneous discernment which separates that truth from the falsehood of the ignorance and inconscience, distinguishes the divine and the undivine in the manifestation and so can be the luminous leader of our other parts of nature. It is only the inmost psychic being, unveiled and emerging in its full power, that can lead us. At each moment, it catches, exposes, repels the minds and the lives' falsehoods, seizes hold on the truth of the divine. The truth shall be the leader of their lives. Truth shall dictate their thought and speech and act. This body of ours, this surface being, is a symbol of our real being. And everything is a symbol of a higher reality. Generally, says Sri Aurobindo, all forms are symbols. The world is a symbol system expressing God to himself in his own consciousness. consciousness. Sri Aurobindo explains, a symbol, as I understand it, is the form on one plane that represents a truth of another. For instance, a flag is the symbol of a nation. Each form is a symbol of some divine power, vibhuti, concealed in it. And to the seeing eye, each finite carries in it its own revelation of the infinite. Our bodies are symbols which progressively reveal the divine. They are in everything, existing phenomenally, or we shall say symbolically. Two parts, the thing in itself and the symbol. Self and nature. Res, thing that is, and factum, 
thing that is made. Immutable being and mutable becoming. That which is supernatural in it and that which is natural. Every symbol being a partial expression of God reaches out to and seeks to become its own entire reality. It aspires to become its real self by transcending its apparent self. Ultimately, says the mother, all form is a symbol. All forms. Our form is a symbol. Not a very brilliant one, I admit, she says. Because at this stage of evolution, we are still very imperfectly expressing the divine. We are very much distorted. The whole aim is to become, as Sri Aurobindo says in Savitri, an image undefaced of God. The human being on earth is God playing at humanity. In a world of matter, under the conditions of a hampered density, with the ulterior intention of imposing law of spirit on matter, a nature of deity upon human nature. Evolution is nothing but the progressive unfolding of spirit out of the density of material consciousness and the gradual self-revelation of God out of this apparent animal being. The Gita explains that this body is the field of the spirit. And in this body, there is someone who takes cognizance of the field, the knower of nature. And it is not the physical body alone, which is the field, but all too that the body supports, the vital, the mind. And this too is only the individual field. There is a larger, a universal, a world body, a world field of the same knower. For in each embodied creature, there is this one knower. This seemingly small embodied consciousness. Physically, it is a microcosm in the macrocosm. And the macrocosm too, the large world too, is a body and field inhabited by the spiritual knower. The universe, after all, is only one person, only one individuality, in the midst of the eternal creation. Each universe is a person who takes form, lives, dissolves, and another takes shape. It is the same thing. For us, the person is the human individual. And from the universal point of view, the person is the universal individual. It is one universe in the midst of all the universes. It's like each one of us is a cell or an atom of the body of the universe. And the physical universe is the body of God an individual, one with cosmic self, was the creator and the lord of all, says Sri in Savitri. The universe was his body, God its soul. All was one single immense reality. Her spirit saw the world as living God, it saw the one and knew that all was his. In the same way, a people 
a great human collectivity, is, in fact, an organic living being, says Sri Aurobindo, with a collective, or rather a common or communal soul, mind and body, the nation or society, like the individual, has a body, an organic life, a moral and aesthetic temperament, a developing mind, and a soul behind all these signs and powers, for the sake of which they exist. One may say even that, like the individual, it essentially is a soul, rather than has one. It is a group soul. The parallel is just at every turn, because it is more than a parallel. It is a real identity of nature. There is only this difference, that the group soul is much more complex, because it has a greater number of partly self-conscious mental individuals for the constituents of its physical being instead of an association of merely vital subconscious cells. So what is true at the individual level is also true at the collective level, as well as at the universal level. It is like fractals, infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different scales. Every society, represents a collective being, and in it and by it, the individual lives, and he owes to it all that he can give it. More, it is only by a certain relation to the society, a certain harmony with this greater collective self, that he can find the complete use for his many developed or developing powers and activities. It's like each one is a piece of the puzzle, an aspect of the divine, and needs to find its exact place in the whole. We have, every one of us, a role to fulfill, a work to do, a place which we alone can occupy. Because each one of us has a particular nature. It is what is called in India our dharma the truth of our being, the fundamental law of our nature, which secretly conditions all our activities. Somebody asked the mother, then what is a hierarchy? And she replied, it is the organization of the functions and the manifestation in action of the particular nature of each person. And she explains, each element becomes the divine, but not the totality of the divine, for the divine is everything. You can't take a piece of the divine and say, this is the divine. And yet, in his spiritual consciousness, each one has a perfect relation with the divine. That is to say, each one is the divine as perfectly as he can be. But to reconstruct the divine, all the divine is necessary. And it is precisely this that constitutes the very essence of hierarchy. <laughs>